Hi. Yes. That's not what you want to do. Right. Honestly. Should we just start, Greg? What do you reckon? Ten past. We can always uh, backtrack a bit, won't we? Okay. I don't know. I've got some at my place, but what? You know, we, I had sheets, sheets. Uh, sheets, towels, all sorts of things, pillows. Sheets, as in the copy, no, because this wasn't part of our regular uh, seminars, so I haven't got translations of anything. So we're doing these a bit from the hip. Uh, if you do a tackle for me, maybe you need the the sheet, the sheet. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can see if I can find them. Like Are they still coming? Me, me yeah. is a last. Is still coming? Yes, please remind me. You can see your family. Okay. All right, well, while we're waiting, we're going to be looking, we're going to look again at Ezekiel 38. And while we're waiting, we'll start when we start. But for those who are here early, I'll tell you something more about Ezekiel 38. So we're on page 1394. One, three, nine, four. So it's about almost in the middle. Okay. <laughs> so this is in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel lived about, what, 500 years before the birth of Jesus. So 2,500 years ago, give or take. The dominant empire at that time that was controlling much of what we would call today the Middle East. So Israel and Syria and Iran and Iraq, the sort of dominant empire at the time was the Babylonians. But 
just because they were the dominant empire didn't mean that they were the only nation causing trouble. Just as today, we would say America is probably the strongest army in the world. The next greatest sort of army and nation in the world today, probably China, followed by, I don't know, and yet Russia, which is way down the list, is causing lots and lots of trouble today. Well, at the time of Ezekiel, the same thing had just happened. Babylon was the America of the time. But just a few years earlier, these barbarian tribes had come down from the north. No one knew who they were quite or where they came from. And they rushed south, capturing territory, killing, invading, pillaging. They got all the way south to Egypt and then headed north again and disappeared. And that's the basis for our story in Ezekiel 38. Good evening. You don't have to sit together, love. <laughs> Okay. No matter. Dan was doing a little bit of talking anyway. Well, good evening, everyone. Nice to see you all. Uh, Nice to see you again. Okay, we might make a start then. As normal, we will commence with a prayer. Yahweh, the eternal God, the God of the Bible, the God of Israel, the creator God of, the, of all the heavens and the earth. We bow before you to thank you for the opportunity to study the pages of your word, to learn about things that you indicated and prophesied thousands of years ago, which we can see coming to pass in front of our very eyes today. We honour you as the God who knows the end from the beginning and controls the destiny of the nations. In Jesus Christ's name. Right, now, last week, we looked at the very first half of Ezekiel chapter 38. We looked at Ezekiel 37. Can anyone remember what Ezekiel 37 was about? What was Ezekiel 37, uh, 37 about? Yeah, it's quite far. Mm. And, uh, yep. The valley of the dry bones, which eventually all the bones came to form skeletons and flesh came on them and muscles, and eventually they stood up breathing. And what did that represent? What was that a prediction about? Uh, it was a about the rebirth of the Jewish people as a nation of Israel, wasn't it? Okay, so Ezekiel 37 talks about the reformation, the rebirth of the Jewish nation, Israel, which happened in 1948 and then further in 1967. And then Ezekiel 38, we saw how that it talks about a large confederacy, a large group of nations that are going to invade Israel and try to destroy Israel. And so tonight, Dan is going to take up the story in Ezekiel 38. <coughs> we saw in verse 8 how that um, the nations were going to come against the people that was in a land that was regathered. They were regathered from many nations, a land that had been desolate for a long time. 
And today we have the nation of Israel as a vibrant, living, powerful nation in a rejuvenated land. And we see how this chapter was talking about Russia. Russia is the, is the, the power in the north that has an intention upon the land of Israel. So I hand over to Dan tonight to carry on with the rest of that story. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. So in Ezekiel 38, we already saw that it's got a long list of names, strange names, Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, Goma, Togoma, and many others. And when we looked at it, we were able to see that these names are names that we can follow through history from Ezekiel's time all the way to today. And the name means a country today. I want to give you another example of, of a way this is done. In the Bible, there is a passage that talks about a nation called Sinim. Sinim. Yes, I know. Uh, Sinim. There's just one verse that talks about this nation called Sinim. And it's a very distant nation from Israel. So, so the people who wrote the Bible live in the area we would call Israel today. And one of those authors, Jeremiah, talks about the people of Sinem. Does anyone have a guess? Does anyone want to guess where the people of Sinem come from? Who are the people of Sinem? Are you okay with the English? Or do you need translation? Yeah. You want some translation? Yeah. All right, Susan or Andy. Okay,那今天大概给我们讲一下,还是接着上上上个星期我们都学了这个张军上半部分,今天我们接着要学一下下面下部分,然后今天我们在刚才问的一个问题就是说,还是关于,关于这个过去的名字,现在是在还是叫
So that's in verse uh, eight and verse nine. So where will we start? Maybe with Don. If we start with you, Don, verse eight and verse nine. Um, in, in Ezekiel 38. Please. After many days, after many days, you will be mustered. In the latter years, you will go against the land that is restored from war. The land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will be like the cloud that covers the land, you and all your soul and the many people with you. So in these verses, the nations we talked about last class, including Russia and Russia's leader, whose name in this chapter is Go, will invade, well, it says here, Israel. It says it in verse 8, the people who live on the mountains of Israel. And, of course, the people who lives upon the mountains of Israel are Israelis or will be. So these verses describe an invasion from the north. So an invasion from the north coming south of nations into the land of Israel. So let's keep reading now, and we'll read verse 10 to 12, please. And he said, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will fall upon the quiet people who dwell securely, all of them dwelling without walls and having no bars or gates. He said, the Lord is not for you. Then the prayer of your father, the home will camp. Well done. And, and the people, the people who were get together from the nations who have a court acquired. acquired. So these verses describe what the Russian army is thinking. The, the Russian army is thinking the place we will invade is not heavily fortified. They don't have walls, they don't have bars, they don't have gates, so it will be easy for us to invade. So 
in many ways, they're thinking different to Ukraine. Ukraine has been hard for them to invade. And they think that the place they will invade now, Israel, will be easy for some reason. But they have another reason in these verses because in verse 12, we are told they are invading to get plunder, which is a word that means money or possessions, wealth. If I come to your house and I take plunder, I will take all the good things in your house and leave only the bad. So they are going to invade to get money, to get wealth from this place. And we can see in verse 12 that these people have livestock and goods. In other words, the things you get from trade. Thank you. But the invasion does not happen by itself alone. Just as with the invasion of Ukraine, where NATO and America have said to Russia, no, stop. So also in this invasion, there will be nations that will say to Russia, what are you doing? And that is described for us in verse 13. So we need to read verse 13. Yeah, merchants. Well done. That was a difficult verse. So now we're introduced to some more nations, but these ones are not on Russia's side. They are adversaries or enemies of Russia who say to Russia, stop, what are you doing? So let's look at those verses. A question to you, what are the names of the nations in Ezekiel 38 who say stop? They're all in verse 13. Anyone? Sheba, excellent. Dedan, and one other. Excellent. Very well done. Thank you for that. 
Now, does everybody know what the word merchants means? Show of hands if you know what merchant means. means. Do you know what merchant means? No? Good. I will explain. So a merchant is somebody who buys or makes goods to sell to somebody else for profit. So the merchants of Tarshish are people who are selling goods for money. Traders. So in, in the, if you like, in the, the system of society of the Bible, they are not students. They are not rulers. They are not teachers. They are merchants. And these ones are described as merchants of Tarshish. So what we want to do is we want to understand who these, these people are, who these nations are, Sheba, Didan, Tarshish, and, and there's another group hidden in this verse here. They're called in this Bible uh, young leaders. Young leaders, all its leaders, verse, uh, verse 13. But you'll notice that at the very, there's a number one, a tiny little one next to the word leaders. And down the bottom, it says Hebrew, young lions. So the ancient language of the Bible has actually got their young lions, not young leaders. So we want to understand four groups of people. Sheba, Dedan, Tarshish, and the young lions. Who are they? Mm. Mm. So just as we did with Rosh and Meshach, we can find these nations. And we're going to start with Sheba and Dedan. So uh, let me just get my machine to do what it's meant to do, and then we'll be good. Got a me. Behave. Come on. That's wonderful. All right. There we go. Okay. So let's start with Sheba, first of all. So Sheba is mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. There is a famous story from the time of King David. King David lived about, oh, what would we say, 900 years before Jesus. And he was the greatest military general that the nation of Israel ever had. He was the ancestor of Jesus Christ. And during the time of his son, a man by the name of Solomon, a, another king, or in this case, queen, came to visit Solomon. Uh, Ancestor, 
so mm. say again address yes yes a place mm. well done so in the story of solomon the queen of sheba came to visit solomon and we can find this place sheba in in old documents and old maps it looks like that today sheba would be in yemen Mm. Mm. But probably uh, the territory of Sheba was a little bit broader than that. It probably was the, those coasts of, of the Arabian Peninsula. So uh, it's okay. We'll leave it where it is. That's fine. So probably modern day Yemen. And interestingly, even today in Yemen, there is a city called Sheban in modern day Yemen. That's a very old city, very, very old. But the interesting thing about Sheban is that even though it's thousands of years old, it's famous for its mud brick skyscrapers. <laughs> Mm. So these are not uh, modern skyscrapers or apartments. They're from these ones at least the 16th century. So very old mud brick towers. So that's Sheban in what we would call Yemen today. Uh, just a, a picture of modern day Yemen and one of its main cities. Now you'll see in this picture, I have chosen to put in two images, one of a British warship in Yemen and the other celebrating uh, the visit of the king and the queen, not this king of queen, but the king and the queen of England to Yemen in 1923 and 1948. Yeah, very long time ago. Mm. Mm. So, mm. so both of these pictures show a connection between Britain and Yemen or Sheba. UK, United Kingdom. I want you just to remember that picture, that thought of a connection between the United Kingdom and Sheba or Yemen, because there's a reason I have that picture there. So that's Sheba. Yemen and, and perhaps Oman as well. Who knows? 
What about B, Dan? Well, the map up on the screen shows Saudi Arabia. And I'm going to fly down into Saudi Arabia and I'm going to show you something in Saudi Arabia. So let's have a look at Saudi Arabia. Yeah. So let's fly down into Saudi Arabia and have a look at something here. So, so we've come closer to Saudi Arabia and the map is not brilliant, but I want to circle something. I don't know if you can see the words that that pin is over, but just let me see if I can show you. Can you see that word there? See that? Now this is a modern map. You can look this up on Google Maps. See that? And this yellow territory here is the ancient territory of Dedan. So we know, there you go, there's some of some photos from ancient Dedan. Old mud brick houses, dry desert territory, but in places, oasis, Almost Dr. Zeusian. So Sheba and Didan, Yemen and Saudi Arabia. Perhaps also countries like Oman, UAE, and others. So what about Tarshish? Who was Tarshish? Let's find out. Mm. Mm. Merchants. So in the Bible, there is lots of information about Tarshish to help us find Tarshish. This is, even though there's lots of information, it's still very difficult to find Tarshish. <laughs> On the screen is a list of Bible passages that talk about Tarshish and a summary of what we learn from those passages about Tarshish. So we're going to go through some of these clues to help us find Tarshish. Mm. So we will use the information in the Bible to help us understand where Tarshish is today. Mm. Okay. So the first clue comes from Genesis 10. So let's go to Genesis 10. Genesis 10 will be about page, yeah, 20, sorry, page, page 13, right at the start, 13. Uh, and Fran, I might get you to read this whole section for me, just because I'd rather 
inflict all these names on you, if you don't mind. Mm, page 13, chapter 10. So we're just going to read from verse 2 to 5, please, uh, Fran. So, sorry, just before we start reading, what we're reading about in this verse is the family tree, the children of Noah. And you will remember that in the Bible story of Noah, everybody else died apart from Noah and his three sons. And we're going to find out how did we go from just Noah with three sons, that's what's on the screen there, to all the nations of today. Yeah. Uh, two to five, please, friend. Reading um, chapter 10, verse 2. The sons of Jacob, Goma, Mago, Magai, Jabin, Tubal, Meshach, and Tiraz. The sons of Goma, Ashkenaz, Rechbath, and Togoma. The sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish. Oh, did you see that? Hittim and Dodoma. From these, the coastal peoples spread in their lands, each with his own language. Bible plans in their nations. Mm. Okay, so on the screen, we'll show what we just read. So Noah has three sons, Japheth, Ham, Shem, not in that order. Japheth has Goma, Meshach, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Magog, and Tiras. We're interested in Javan. So Noah, Japheth, Javan. Now Javan has Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. And it makes a strange comment in verse 5 that these are, in this Bible, it says the coastland peoples. But in other Bibles, it says the island peoples. Island. That's important. So let's have a look at who these people are because it will help us understand who Tarshish is. Mm. So these are island people. So here's. Mm. So these are the, the island peoples. Maybe not these islands, but islands nonetheless. Okay, so first of all, here's Kittim. Kittim is modern day Cyprus, an island. So the people who came from this person, Kittim, end up on Cyprus. And then the name, the ancient name of Cyprus was Kittim. So it's an island. Who was Dodanum? Well, we're not quite sure, but there's two places that have been proposed. One of them is Rodanum. In other words, the island of Rhodes in the Mediterranean Sea. The others is the Dokanese Islands, also in the Mediterranean Sea. We don't know which, but historians have suggested both of those are likely descendants of Dodenum. So that's two of them, both living on islands, just so you can see. 
Thank you. All right. So those are the, those are, we've got Kitim, we've got Dodanum. Alishar is a little bit harder, but again, the suggestion is that Alishar is, is this place here called Ellis, which although it's not an island, it's not far off an island. Uh, you can see this tiny little thin you see my mouse pointer? Yeah, this tiny little thing here called the, I think it's the Isthmus, joins Ellis to the rest of Greece. But for that, it would be an island. And in fact, this here is so narrow that in Bible times, rather than sail round here, mariners would actually take their ship out of the water and carry it across here instead of going all the way around. It was easier. But don't worry about that. That's extra. So an island almost. So what about Tarshish? That's, that's the bit we're trying to work out. Who is Tarshish? Well, the clue we've got so far is an island. The rest are islands. So we're looking for someone who's probably an island nation. Mm. Okay, so what other clue do we have? Well, also, because they come from Japheth, Japheth was the father of Caucasians broadly. That's a simplification, but broadly, Japheth gave birth to all the Caucasian nations. So we have, therefore, a limiting of who Tashish can be, Caucasian and living on an island. So Spain, not an island. Portugal, not an island. Russia, not an island. All right. Mm. Now, there's another story in the Bible about a man called Jonah. And Jonah tried to run away from God. He couldn't, but he tried. And when he tried to run away from God, he got on a boat at a place called Joppa, which is here. And he ran away to the furthest place he knew of. So he tried to, it would be like me saying, I'm going to run from God. I will go to Mars. He did the same thing furthest place he could imagine, which was Tarshish. He got on a boat to go to Tarshish. Now, here's the thing. Because he got on a boat at Joppa, that tells us a kind of region that Tarshish must be in. Oops, let's come back to that. Tarshish cannot be east of Israel because you can't take a boat from Joppa eastward, can you? Very bouncy on the land when your boat. You have to go west from Joppa. So we know from that that Tarshish is west of Israel. So it's an island west of Israel, but we also know from the story it's not going to be close to Israel because he's trying to run to Mars, a far place. 
So wherever it is, it's somewhere way out here. So first of all, we learned must be an island, probably Caucasian. Do you know what Caucasian means? Uh, like me, not like you. So Caucasian means white skinned uh, European, generally. Mm. Yeah. So uh, Japheth was the father of the European white skinned Caucasian people. Mm. And then we learned from the story of Jonah that Tarshish is west of Israel, not east. All right. Also, those times they came across the oceans with red boats. Yes. Except for Tarshish vessels. That's what they were. Tarshish was specifically an ocean going vessel. That's why we can talk about this later. Yeah. All right. So, what else do we learn? Well, oh, this is uh, just saying realistically west of Israel and, and must be a long way west. So, I'm making a suggestion based on those things an island west of Israel with Caucasian people, Britain is a, a good alternative, a good option. Mm. Mm. So I'm going to go fast now because I, I don't think there's a lot of value in me laboring this more than I already have. But we also know that whoever Tashish was, they were a trader in minerals, including tin and silver and iron and lead. And the interesting thing is that when you go into the historians, you can find that Britain was an island that did exactly that. They sold particularly tin and iron and lead. Which one do we want to go back to? I'm getting there, just a second. Mm. So the Bible says that tin, lead, copper, iron were all found in Tarshish. So wherever Tarshish is, you need to find those minerals. And one of the most ancient sources of tin was Britain. And in fact, tin was found all over Europe. But there was only one place that it was found as tin as opposed to uh, tin oxide, I think. I forget what it's called. Tin, the oxide of tin. And that was in Cornwall. It was found as pure tin in Cornwall. So, yeah, Britain, pardon me, in Britain or the United Kingdom. <laughs> mm. All right, so we've put together a whole lot of whole lot of little things to say. Here is where we think Tarshish is. I'm, I don't want to go through this anymore, but long story short, I 
think we can safely say that the Tarshish and Tarshish's merchants refers to Britain or the United Kingdom and their trading power. So here's where it gets kind of interesting. Oh, we'll go very quickly. Britain is a strong naval power, which again the Bible predicts. Uh, here are some of the colonies of Britain. So in red, anywhere in red was a colony of the United Kingdom at one point. They were enormously strong navy and naval power, uh, including the United States of America. But that's time. Skip over that. Now, this is, this is important. Remember I said, remember the picture of uh, a British warship in Yemen and the picture of the king and queen of England going to Yemen. That's why I showed you that picture. There's a connection between the United Kingdom, Tarshish, and Sheba. Now, one of the symbols of Britain, Tarshish, is the lion. Here is some cartoons from many years showing Britain as the lion. And interestingly, that one with the, the sailor lion, you can see the lion, he's got a hat on, he's a sailor because he's an island night lion. And on the side of what he's got there in the trolley, it says British trade. Remember, we said there were merchants of Tarshish. Britain has always been a merchant or a trading nation. Mm. Mm. All right, so we want to just have a look at this idea of the lion because this is going to become important. Because remember, there was one other group of people in this story called the young lions. Our Bible says young leaders. The Hebrew says young lions. Now, who are the young lions? Well, this poster is from the First World War. And in the First World War, the, the British sent this poster to, to us in Australia and to Canada and New Zealand. And the poster said, the young lions is calling on the old, uh, sorry, the old lion is calling on young lions. In other words, Britain described her colonies as young lions. Now, today, Britain has a special term for the nations that were her colonies. So, a colony is uh, a place that you, uh, maybe a, a big country will claim another territory as its own and they will colonize it. So for example, Hong Kong was a British colony for a long time. So this is what's called the Commonwealth. The, the, all of these nations were at one point colonies of Britain. Mm. Mm. 
But what's really interesting is this. Many of them are islands. So Britain was an island nation from the island people of Japheth. And the children of Britain, the young lions, likewise are characterized by being mostly island nations. Mm. Mm. And so we know who these nations are. Sheba is Yemen and Oman and UAE. Didan, Saudi Arabia. Tashish, the United Kingdom. The Young Lions, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Fiji, places like that. They are the nations that will say to Russia, why are you invading Israel? What are you doing? Now this, it is upside down. Well spotted, Auntie Fran. Very well spotted. An acute mind. Um, so this map is upside down. This is a map of the world from Russia's perspective. And if you look at the world from Russia's perspective, they're going downhill and, and well, I don't know why that's there. I'm sorry, I have no idea why that's there. Mm. So looking at the world from their perspective, they will have, we're told, an evil thought and they will go, well, here's, I know now why it's there. What is that evil thought? Well, that evil thought is there is one nation in the world where if we invade it, plunder it, no one will mind how many people we kill and how much treasure we take. Mm. Mm. This is the evil thought. We've seen it before. It's not a new evil thought. It's a very old evil thought. The evil thought is that the Jewish people are a problem. Nobody likes them. If we invade Israel and kill many Jews, no one will care. And this is exactly what Hitler thought. Mm. All right, we might, I think, leave it there, given the amount of time we've spent. But I just wanted to say one other thing before Greg takes over. Ezekiel 38 does not leave it there. Uh, I'm not sure whether we're going to spend another class on Ezekiel 38. Yep. Okay. But I want you to go home and know this, that Ezekiel 38 shows the world at war, but at the end of Ezekiel 38, God establishes his presence in the world. In other words, God says, I can fix everything. Mm. 
So Ezekiel 38 is a terrible chapter about a coming war in the near future, but in the end of it, God will fix not just Israel, but the whole world. Thanks, Dan. Now, the chapter is a bit of slow going because we have to try and establish what the name is referred to. But the story that we get into next time when Russia invades, Britain and other nations oppose them, big battles, but God takes control, God intervenes. An amazing future for the world when God says, I have given man enough time to show whether he can govern this world in peace and righteousness. We've made a big mess of it, and God is going to take control. Okay, we can talk in a minute, but we'll just conclude. We'll just finish with a prayer. Yahweh, the almighty God, as we look at the world in turmoil, as nations struggle to try to be the top nations, to take things for themselves and their own people and for their leaders, we long for the time when you will take control of this world and govern this world in peace and righteousness and there will be no more fear from evil men. We thank you for this insight that we have into the future, that we can look beyond the time of trouble that now is and look for the time when your kingdom will be established on this earth. We thank you for the things that you have written that we can learn from. In Jesus Christ's name. Okay, so next week we'll go through the rest of Ezekiel 38. Good idea to read it before you come, to have a read of the rest of Ezekiel 38, help you understand what it's about. Now, do you folk have, have a Bible you can read? Okay, good. English, English or Chinese. Okay, good. Excellent. So, so the rest, the rest of Ezekiel thirty eight.
two chapters of the New Testament. Yeah, that is a start. You have to start somewhere. So uh, we haven't got any idea about the uh, Old Testament. So what what we do in this series of studies is we start at Genesis at the very beginning and work our way through the Bible. At the moment, we are taking a break to look at Ezekiel 38 because of what Russia is doing in Ukraine. But at the moment, we are into the New Testament. We'll go back to do some more study of the New Testament in two weeks' time. But next week is Ezekiel 38. We'll finish it off.